Okay, guys, so we are slowly reaching the end. <laughs> this is the last, last presentation. I think you had enough of me already. Uh, so um, in, in this one, we are leaving the resilience. And we'll, we'll, be talking, uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about the kind of significance of the climate change impact on, and especially focusing on the impact on extreme, on extreme uh, uh, precipitation and flooding. The, 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 this, particular study, this particular study is looking the whole kind of country of Canada um, as the region, and I already pointed out Canada is the second largest country is really covering the various kind of climate, um, uh, climate, uh, climates, uh, and finding the way how to kind of aggregate all this information um, into some message uh, is not very easy. So there are a lot of kind of research is being done in utilizing different ways of uh, getting this. And in this presentation, you will see one potential from the new type of climate products or the data that comes from the global climate uh, modeling. <coughs> the work is supported by the same kind of source that I was mentioning, the previous work and so on. Um, that source was uh, the reinsurance company that gave us some funding uh, pretty significant funding to kind of combine, you know, their money with the federal and two people very involved in this work. Um, uh, Mr. Abishigawur is a postdoc and uh, his sister, <laughs> his sister as the master student working on this uh, project. What I think, again, going to the conclusions of the presentation, this was the first time uh, kind of Canada-wide assessment of the future changes in flood hazard and risk was done. Um, this assessment was comprehensively uh, completed with a relatively de detailed insight into uncertainty associated with the climate information that's being used in projecting the future runoff. And we found pretty interesting impacts in different kind of regions, northern provinces of Canada, southwestern Ontario, northeastern Quebec, uh, southern prairies, where the expectation is that the frequency of flooding would majorly increase, and other regions like a northern prairies, north central Ontario, uh, where the flooding will be, a frequency will be decreasing. So you see, when you are looking at a very large, very large uh, uh, region, that impacts the impacts may be on in, a, in kind of both directions. Increase in one region or one part of the region, decrease in another part of the region. And that's the, I think, value of kind of doing and performing this uh, regional uh, uh, analysis, um, not kind of relying on a particular locality and, you know, what you find in a very local level as the outcome of the impact. Uh, we are also finding um, w w what we have performed beside the analysis of the hazard and how it will affect the frequency of the flooding in different regions of Canada. We also try to calculate the risk to 100 most populated municipalities and 1,500, 1,500 locations of the main water-related infrastructures, including reservoirs, um, uh, river intakes, water supply intakes, uh, and other very important infrastructure points. And the reason why we included that into the analysis is that to, to, through this, to kind of assess, should we review the way how this infrastructure is operated? Is there a value of re-evaluating the use of storage, let's say existing dams and reservoirs, maybe under the climatic conditions and the changing frequency of the high and low flows be used better in a different way? So that's kind of being assessed now on the, on the kind of national level. I'm going to walk you through the kind of introduction, the, the, the methodology, um, a little bit on the models and the data that we used, and also show you the results, um, the results of the analysis. Uh, this is a kind of picture of what is happening in Canada. 
uh, observations are, these observations are from, oh my God, I'm sorry, the wrong button. The observations are uh, showing the, the observations and especially these kind of observations of the average annual temperature are showing that basically a very large portion of the Canada is becoming warmer. The, the north, especially north, the western part, as you, as you can see, is you know experiencing pretty significant warming, and it, this warming is kind of changing obviously the precipitation patterns and concentration of the vapor, and therefore also changing the um, extreme extreme precipitations. Uh, I told you that most of the population lives in a very narrow band and the narrow kind of area to the border. But the changes that are occurring in the north and the western part are affecting some of the major rivers. And most of the, let's say, hydropower and, uh, is coming actually from utilization of the, uh, and building the power stations in the, uh, in the north. When you convert this to the precipitation or, you know, the observation of the precipitation is also showing some pretty significant uh, changes. You know, the changes are kind of going for the most of the country up to the 30-50% increase and for some of the northern east regions decrease and for the central parts of Canada the green color increase above, you know, above 70-80%. So that's the, we are talking, you know, from 1960s to 2015 approximately, basically the observations uh, that are confirming that something is changing with the climate over Canada. Uh, it's becoming warmer and it's becoming uh, followed by the different precipitation, uh, precipitation patterns. Okay, so, so these are observations. And also we did analysis, um, um, not part of this study, I'm just giving you, this is an introduction. Uh, the, the analysis has been done f uh, with utilization of the climate models to look at the change in the next kind of 100 years. Um, this is the change in the minimum, maximum, the three slides, minimum, maximum, average temperature, and the bottom three slides in the precipitation. And again, the message is very much the same. You see the north being exposed to very, very significant warming um, and also the change of the precipitation. But with the kind of further expansion uh, uh, to the, you know, very populated, very populated regions, regions of the country. Um, <coughs> these are ob these, this type of analysis are done utilizing the climate models, utilizing various emission scenarios. That's the, you know, that's the most conservative picture of the RCP in point five. And if that future occurs, you know, very serious changes will be experienced in the country. Um, I am, I'm not saying that, you know, the single model predictions are uh, sufficiently accurate, but doing the predictions with the multiple models may help us better understand. But everything is pointing in this direction. It's pointing towards more warming, it's pointing to more precipitation, it's pointing to more frequent precipitation across, across the country. Okay, so the impact of something like that on flooding is pretty significant. Flows in the flood plains are kind of controlled, you know, by the topography, by friction. Um, this is the picture from the, the last spring uh, and flooding in the vicinity, vicinity of Montreal and uh, the, the areas between the Ontario and Quebec. Uh, the floods in the same area repeated this year this spring, uh, considerable damage was experienced, and what is actually much more <coughs> significant is that in two years in a row, you got the flooding, which is exceeding the return period of 100 years. And you know how the people react if you experience the flood last year, you expect to be okay next 100 years, but that's not the case. That's not the case. So it is kind of indication that something is changing in the frequency of these events. Um, modeling and finding out, you know, the consequences of that kind of 
finding the spatial patterns, water depths, velocities, and so on, requires relatively good uh, knowledge of the uh, um, <coughs> forces that are kind of affecting. It requires, you know, two-dimensional modeling um, in, spice, uh, in space, in time. Um, and um, usually, usually we have a very powerful tool and common methodologies for answering these questions and doing this modeling on a small scale. However, if you kind of look at the whole country uh, and the scale of the size of Canada, that kind of larger scale modeling uh, cannot be achieved with the traditional tools. And nowadays, nowadays we are kind of slowly reaching, I think, the point that simplified two-dimensional hydraulic models, um, faster and more powerful computers, um, and more data, more data available from the climate um, models that inputs in the form of the precipitation. Even a runoff right now is being produced by a number of uh, climate models is possibly or starting to give us opportunity to perform that larger scale larger scale modeling. And this effort was really going into that direction to see what can be done on a larger scale and how we can capture the change uh, within the country. <coughs> so we set the objectives for the research in the following way, to look at the magnitude of two return periods, 100 years and 250 years. Uh, these two periods are selected because in uh, most of the country they are considered to be the so-called regulatory floods. Uh, most of the regulations related to the land use and so development and so on are related to knowledge of what the you know, 100 and 250 year return period uh, floodplains will look like. Um, in, 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 in Canada, the responsibility for the regulation is um, between the federal government and the local, you call them states, we call them provinces, and they are establishing this kind of criteria. So we may have a difference between different provinces in the details. The province of Ontario, where the London is located, has a dual criteria that within the 100 year return period floodway, uh, no development is allowed, and within 250, uh, some development with the special, special permits from the water management agencies um, is possible. In the neighboring province, we have a completely different, uh, completely different criteria, where the <coughs> in the province of Manitoba, in a 400-year return period uh, uh, floodplain, no development is allowed. But you have a different topography, you have a different kind of conditions, and therefore I, I assume you know, differences in this criteria. Uh, however, uh, that was the objectives, and we, most of the provinces, I think, I think are working somewhere within this regulatory floods or using them. Um, the second objective was to find out the change in uh, uh, timing of the peak flood events across the country, the assess, assess the future flood risk for the you know, 100 cities, and we call them flow regulation infrastructure locations, and also provide some assessment of the in uncertainty that's involved in that kind of estimate. Because you know, multiple models are used, um, uh, the climate models are used, multiple emission scenarios are used, and that kind of offers the kind of range of uncertainty around the predictions. That's how we actually approach the problem. So the starting point was the use of the lower resolution future runoff projections. So for the first time, I think, in a pretty serious and large-scale study, we utilized the climate models um, and the uh, 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 output from the climate models in the form of the runoff. Mostly in the past and very often, the key uh, hydrometeorological variables are used, temperature, precipitation, possibly pressure, and so on. The, the uh, runoff is derived variable, and it's a product of introduction of hydrology into the global climate models. So what, you know, professor from a neighboring university to mine would say the meteorologists are slowly discovering hydrology. 
Um, and now these global climate models are actually including, including the hydrological processes inside and able to generate uh, together with the climate information some of the hydrologic information that are of more value to you know, activities that we are involved with. Uh, so uh, for the first time I think we use the runoff directly from the climate models uh, you have to realize that the resolution of these models is very, you know, coarse, two to five degrees, um, like 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer grid. And, you know, that kind of scale is capturing and affecting, you know, smaller watersheds and the way how uh, the flooding is occurring on the smaller scale. Um, um, it's definitely, definitely limited, uh, or our ability to is limited by uh, by that low resolution. <coughs> so, in order to now uh, deal with this resolution and downscale this information to more kind of watershed scales, we utilize the uh, hydrodynamic model and especially the macro scale hydrodyna uh, hydrodynamic model. Uh, we investigated, there are multiple models available uh, nowadays. Uh, um, uh, we investigated a number of them, tested, communicated with the developers of the models, and we decided to proceed with the Kamaflad. Kamaflad is the model developed at University of Tokyo. Um, it's being used in uh, uh, assessments of the change of climate on a global scale. For uh, there are a couple of uh, a couple of very significant publications which are basically obtaining the change and the impact on the change of the frequency. Uh, frequency of flooding um, and frequency change in the frequency of different return period, uh, uh, return period flows across the globe. So that was done at University of uh, uh, University of Tokyo. Uh, the people in Europe did similar studies for the uh, uh, Europe, and they also utilized the Kama flood model. Um, in spite of the fact that very popular model in Europe is coming from UK, um, the flood list, and uh, unfortunately we were not very happy. They are similar in a way how they are representing and performing the kind of hydrodynamic modeling, but I was not really happy with the way how the support was provided and also some of the assumptions that uh, the flood list had. So we opted for Kama flood, we communicated with the University of Tokyo, um, and we got their kind of assistance, and it's very effective assistance that even ran various uh, kind of versions of the model for us over there and joined us in the final, sharing the results of the final work. So through starting with the global climate models and the information, runoff information that's available. Uh, through Kama flood, we downscale that information in kind of space and ended up basically the, the picture of uh, uh, kind of flows on a 10 to 50, 25 uh, kilometer grid across the country. So now that was a um, very, very significant uh, final outcome that is, uh, you know, huge for the country like Canada. Millions of cells are basically of that size covering the overall territory. And we needed very high resolution, uh, sorry, we needed very high computational power to process this information and do the calculation of the, of the probabilistic uh, uh, flows. So we were lucky that our university is part of the Canadian network of the supercomputers and we had access to supercomputing facilities and this was done, uh, uh, this was done using the SharkNet uh, and we ended up with a high resolution of flow projections for the, uh, this grid of the resolution 10 to 25 kilometers and then for that grid we did you know this classical statistical analysis to find the change in the frequency and uh, then we combined um, the frequency change in frequency with the information on the population to find the risk to municipalities and the, we extracted the information for the 
uh, water regulating infrastructure uh, directly from the uh, from the maps and we are able to perform or fit basically the probabilistic distribution to say what the change will be 100 year and 150 year that that was the procedure very demanding kind of analytically but also very innovative from the point of view that for the first time the runoff was used directly from the climate models and the downscaling is done utilizing the hydrodynamic model I'm sorry for the slide. Uh, this is actually showing that we utilized 21 different climate models. Uh, for each of the climate models, you have a link, direct link. You can click on it and actually download, download the data. And here is the summary of what type of information. So these are RCPs, 2.4. 6, 5, 6, and uh, uh, 8.5, and you realize not all the model kind of provide the information for every RCP, and uh, therefore this kind of helped us. This was a kind of starting point to see, you know, how much information do we have on runoff from the climate, global climate models, and what, you know, uh, emission scenarios should be should be considered, and that was um, that was done kind of preliminary. All the data is actually um, uploaded, and they're right now in the laboratory that I'm leading, we keep all this information. But you can directly, basically, if you have interest, you you can di directly kind of go into downloading this information from the. Uh, these links are uh, these links are. Uh, basically links to the centers, the climate centers in different countries where different models are being developed. Um, the, the information is supposed to kind of be in the repository that's managed by the IPCC and some of the information is there but let's say the updated new runs and things like that are not reaching the repository <laughs> in the same kind of time as they're being produced. So we opted and we spent about, you know, <laughs> good three, four months of downloading the data directly from the sites of different um, model producers. Now, <coughs> the ch I already mentioned that kind of uh, choice of the model, uh, the hydrodynamic model, uh, was also a pretty significant task. And we wanted to be sure that, uh, you know, kind of theoretically the models are functioning in the same way. They are considering uh, the grid uh, type of uh, spatial resolution for each grid cell. They solve all the uh, dynamic equations and basically the flow from into the cell and from the cell is being assessed. And this is the way how the basically the whole, um, the whole calculation is done, ending up in providing you with uh, the flow uh, that set each location. There are some kind of uh, assumption how is the water moving, you know, from one cell in what direction. You are using the kind of topographical information to kind of create the water paths. Um, some new um, hydrodynamic modeling that's done on urban uh, uh, level is actually, you know, really uh, allowing the movement of water in different directions, but nothing like that is yet implemented on a larger scale because the solution of the equations is quite demanding in that case if you allow water to move in every possible direction. And I think for the general and traditionally, if you look at the watershed, the water is moving, <laughs> you know, toward from higher elevation to lower elevation. Yeah. Um, within the cities, you may have a little bit different situation uh, where, you know, the movement can be affected by different infrastructure and so on. So this grid-based river flight plane routing calculation is done within the model. Input is the runoff that we obtain from the GCMs, and flow is then calculated for each cell, uh, each cell within the grid. The output includes also the water storage within the cell, and this is the kind of key theoretical method that's implemented in the Kama flood, the so-called fle flexible location of water set flow method. Uh, and that's what I was kind of explaining. How is the water moving, you know, within each cell? That's the part of the algorithm. Uh, not only that we were evaluating different models, we also wanted to see how this model may be performing in the Canadian conditions. So one of the preliminary steps before we did the detailed analysis was 
to run the model with the kind of historical information and um, compare to the observations of flows in different locations. And this map is kind of, uh, kind of showing you the, the correlation between the results from the model calculation, flow calculated from the Kama flood, and the observations uh, where we have the flow observations in Canada. Uh, the, the red or the more intense red is showing the higher correlation and as you can see, you know, pretty good performance was obtained, obtained for the model. So that was a pretty significant test uh, that the model can be kind of used in the, um, in the analysis. <coughs> and now the kind of key uh, kind of, uh, uh, set of scenarios was kind of created. We utilize the daily historic and future uh, GCM runoff information for the historical, and the historical was mostly used for uh, kind of confirming that the model is functioning properly. We used the period 1961 to 2005, and for the future we used 261 to 2100 uh, for, uh, uh, for all emission, uh, emission scenarios. For the places where we didn't have the kind of historical observations, we kind of enhanced the analysis with the reanalysis data, North American reanalysis flow data, and this uh, data set is available for, in, again, in a gridded form for the whole North America for the period 1993 to 2007. So that was a kind of supplemental information to our observations. Daily historical liver discharge data was, these are the observations. Um, the, the, again, Environment and Climate Change Canada, federal department is responsible for collecting this information and they're also disseminating through this database called HIDAT. And uh, um, uh, unfortunately, as every other country, the budget cuts are affecting the number of stations where the uh, observations are being uh, collected and therefore you need to kind of enhance your information with some of these products like uh, reanalysis data. Uh, for the assessment of the risk, so, so this is all used in the kind of hazard assessment, change of the frequency of the flows, but for the assessment of the risk we utilize the, just the population data uh, in these 100 most populated cities, and that was done from the uh, Stats Canada data databases. So you realize that, you know, risk is relatively simplified in this calculation, so we are using the probability of hazard, the probability or the, or, or, of the flood, and we multiply that with the kind of number of people that will be affected and that we call the, you know, risk. Obviously, obviously there are much more that can be done in representing the risk in a more high level of detail. We were talking about that, you know, <laughs> in discussing resilience and so on. Okay, so with this data, we proceeded uh, with the simulations, and this is where I was telling you. Uh, the continuous daily simulations were performed for these historical and future flood periods across the country for all the cells. Input was, you know, daily flow data obtained from these 21 climate models and different emission scenarios. So we have a kind of 84 future, 21 historical runs, and then the statistical analysis to outputs was done and, and we calculated the 100-year return and 150-year return period f information. <laughs> that information is com compared to the frequency, you know, obtained from the historical information. We utilize the GEV <laughs> distribution in this process, and that kind of comparison allows us to see the change of the of the frequency. Uh, the method of moments is used to fit the GEV distribution and uh, assess the you know, three parameters, scale, shape, and location parameter. Um, very, you know, kind of traditionally, and I think we talked about that a little bit in IDF uh, presentation. So where the, the most significant challenge for us was really in the kind of scale of the com computation that was require, required. 
So we had over one million model grid cells for which cell you needed to perform the kind of calculation. And we had uh, more than three million days in the kind of, you know, timeline to do the calculation. So that, that, that really, really required serious, um, serious computational support. So I cannot tell you anything about this. I don't have a clue what my assistants did, um, but they uh, really worked very, uh, very hard with the available supercomputing facilities. And also we had a pretty good assistance of the people who are managing the network in uh, deciding how many core processors to use and the way how to set camouflage model so that it can efficiently perform this computation for these millions of millions of cells. So it was very, uh, so, so, so one important part was to set up the computation in the most uh, beneficial way. And the, 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 the way how the supercomputing network is used in, um, in our case is you're sharing the resources with other users. So you provide or you, f uh, you, you, you define your problem, you submit that to the network, and then the network is kind of optimizing and combining the runs of different users in the same time. Uh, how are the processors being occupied, where, when, and so on. It's kind of decided by the network and you don't have much influence. Your influence comes from the proper setup and the better setup provides more efficient use of the resources. Um, <coughs> very large amount of information is generated now. So you had you know, all these millions of cells and days, uh, the flows that are being calculated and that we needed to have a very efficient way to directly take this information from the network onto our servers and our computers in order not to occupy the storage of the, of, of the network with the outcomes. So that was done automatically and as the runs were performed, the outputs were kind of coming, coming back to, uh, to us. Okay, that was more kind of technical, technical stuff and uh, the postdoc involved with this was very, very good in managing learning and uh, doing this calculation. Okay, now we are coming a little bit to the results. Uh, I have a tons of results and I cannot show you everything, but so I made a selection of the kind of output so that you can see uh, that you can see how uh, we process the results. So, so I already pointed out what you see are the millions of grid cells and the color is basically showing the change of the return period for <laughs> different emission scenarios. And this particular screen is showing the results of one particular climate model out of 21 that we uh, were running. Uh, what you will be able to see is that a large portion of the country is going to actually get a decrease, but very many uh, regions, especially important regions for us from the population point of view, are going to experience the increase, increase in frequency. And the most significant portions were the locations of the city, Toronto, Montreal, and other cities in this particular region. Uh, some of the central uh, uh, Canada cities, Vancouver, and other cities were. Basically, the change of the uh, 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 frequency was all in the same direction. The huge, huge uh, increase in frequency. What was important, we were processing the results in various ways. One way was to look at the results for each of the models, for each of the emission scenarios, and see what the kind of difference is. Then we aggregated the results from all 21 models uh, for the particular emission scenario and we found the so-called aggregated output. So, so this one is now the median of 21 different models and uh, again we showed the change in the frequency in the same way. And I'll come back to this slide and the third analysis was we looked at the models and the outputs that are showing the change in the same direction. So if the models are showing the increase 
we kind of put these models together and created the output that we call the kind of a robust medium uh, result. The reason is that different models will give you different outputs. Some may give outputs in a different direction. And this was the idea to try to eliminate the mm -hmm. impact on that uh, by aggregating uh, the, the, the results from the models where the 50% of the models kind of agree. agree. That was called the uh, robust medium, that was aggregated uh, medium, and that was a single model. Uh, am I creating this sound or...? I The, it's picking up the uh, speaker, okay. So I should be staying here. Um, okay, so, so you see for all three, three different types of analysis, uh, we were basically observing the same, same kind of thing and that was essential that in these very populated regions uh, for all the scenarios, we were observing, we were observing the change, <coughs> change in frequency. And the change was going, you know, in a, up to the very high, very high level. You're going to see some extracted information for number of cities. Uh, robust solutions were showing the kind of same thing. Um, and now what we wanted to be kind of sure uh, is to show that, you know, in these results, doesn't matter how we aggregate them, uh, there was a, a level of uncertainty that was coming from the choice of the model, these 21 different models, and from the choice of the uh, 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 emission scenario. So we kind of extracted the information that we call the uncertainty by comparing the 75, 25 uh, 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 percentile and 50 percentile, and basically measuring the, the range of you know, values for uh, for the variable, um, in this case runoff, at different locations. So if you look at the, if you look at the maps generated, the red points are showing the kind of locations where the results are carrying pretty high level of uncertainty. So I think this was a useful additional piece of information to understand that you know, this type of change that's measured and observed through the analysis is you know, function of selected models, selected emission scenario, and that, you know, that there is uncertainty around that. So you can combine this uncertainty information with the change in frequency. <coughs> so the second piece of information and our second objective was to find out the change in timing. And uh, this kind of maps is a little bit harder to fully analyze, but we provided again the robust as well as the aggregated information in showing in the different colors uh, the month uh, within which the peak flow was occurring. And what you may be kind of able to see here is uh, like a darker blue will be switched uh, from uh, April to March. Uh, so the peak occurring earlier in the year. And, you know, from uh, 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 light blue to kind of pinkish will be moved from, which is kind of happening more in the north, will be moved from uh, uh, May to May to April, and the, 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 what, what, what we were kind of seeing is that there is, is that there is a definitely kind of trend across the country for peaks occurring earlier between one and three months earlier. So you have a pending on the location uh, uh, this kind of consequence, which is showing that we will be experiencing floods, you know, with a different frequency, some were more often, some were less often, but definitely earlier. So the global warming, the warming, I think it's definitely affecting because most of the flooding in Canada is uh, s uh, spring runoff related, and the higher temperatures are moving the kind of freshet starting earlier in the year and the melt starting earlier in the year affecting the timing of the, 
of the flat peak. <laughs> so in every location that was relatively clear and I think you know this aggregation of these points and kind of you can see from the mountains, these are the kind of high mountain, rocky mountains, uh, uh, how is the response of the system. I just extracted here the points with the change between one and three months um, earlier, and you can see how they are showing up for different, for different regions, sorry, for different emission scenarios. Okay, uh, risk was, as I pointed out, assessed for the 100 populated, most populated cities and 1,070 uh, uh, flood regulated infrastructure. The cities are on the map with the red dots. Uh, the blue crosses are showing the location of the, of the infrastructure. And again, you're seeing the picture that I was telling you about. Most of the population, most of the population is very close to the border. And also the infrastructure is there in the reservoirs, the water supplies, the intakes and so on. There are some in the northern parts, but they are really, really compared to you know, compared to these regions, uh, very unevenly, very uneven density. Um, the message from this type of analysis was kind of assessed in the, you know, direction of change and the extent of change. Uh, this is the presentation for the cities, and you can see that the red color is showing the uh, kind of increase in the risk of the the direction of the triangle is pointing out in which direction the risk is changing. So there is a very clear message of the increase in the risk of the flooding in most of the populated locations across the country. Um, this is done for the kind of robust, again, the same way of aggregating the information as I was pointing out. <coughs> for the uh, so the flood risk included the population into the uh, uh, into the into the calculation. It is a limited piece of uh, information, but I think it's a good indication that um, yeah, I think risk is also changing. I extracted some of the key uh, locations, and when I show this graph, um, many people get really really affected because you can see, you know, for some of the major cities in Canada that, you know, the frequency, frequency is changing, you know, very, to very high extent. Um, in, you know, Toronto, the 100-year flood becomes something like, you know, 20 years flood, so that, that's, you know, five times more frequent that kind of level of flooding is expected for the various scenarios you see the kind of similar behavior this is the picture of the two different locations 217 2017 and uh, 2019 almost the same streets shown in the Montreal district uh, uh, of um, of you know Pier Juan and it's a uh, it's amazing how the same district was uh, flooded to pretty high extent in two years uh, two years in a row when you summarize this information, between 40 and 60 percent of Canadian uh, cities are at very high risk of uh, uh, river flooding under the climatic change, and that requires really serious consideration. The damage is so high, and the country has to do uh, and take this information under consideration. Uh, this is the kind of same analysis being done now for this, you know, 1,070. Uh, locations of the flow regulating infrastructure, the, 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 the change, the color is different, the brownish is showing the increase in the risk, um, and the summary information is here. Again, you know, more than 50 percent of this location expecting to see the increase in uh, uh, flood magnitudes and also change in flood timing. and. Basically, the meaning or the message out of these two graphs is that you have to look at now almost every location of the piece of infrastructure across the Canada and see is the, the operation of that infrastructure, uh, can that be adapted or modified to adapt to changing, changing conditions. 
And this is, guys, all what I had to say. So this was the, for the first time, this kind of wider assessment being done. Um, these are the findings that in the north and uh, east-south, we are showing very significant change in frequency, increase in frequency. Um, the, the, the areas, especially highly populated areas, are almost all subject to increase in frequency and magnitude. And if you look at the kind of major cities, you know, 60% of them, and if you look at this infrastructure, about 50% of this infrastructure is subject to, um, to higher level of risk from flooding. Again, we did publish a number of uh, uh, papers out of this work. Two of the papers were accepted as a feature papers in the Water Journal. Uh, one is talking about frequency, and another one is talking about uh, risk. They're both, uh, you can, because this is an open access journal, you can, download, you can download them if you're interested. The methodology is presented in them, as well as the detailed results. This is our blue book that kind of describes the process, how we use the, uh, especially, the book is mostly focusing on the camouflage model, setting up the model, um, and could be used for someone who may in, be interested in using this hydrodynamic tool. Questions, <laughs> comments? You guys are okay? That's, that's all what I had during this week for you. <laughs> I think you got, the, you got a lot of information and a lot of messages. And, um, uh, in, in, you know, my, my kind of main intention was to expose you at least to the importance of the changing conditions. And because of that uh, uh, situation, you know, how can we possibly, possibly respond? So the, 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 you s did see a little bit how you can analyze the impact and observe the change or assess the change. You have seen a little bit how you can respond to that by, let's say, IDF updating as also uh, maybe moving from the traditional standards to something like more uh, uh, related to the performance of the systems. I offered and kind of gave you the view of the Quantitative resilience is a, one of the measure, uh, one of the measures to to kind of capture the change and respond and understand better how the systems respond in time to changing conditions. I think there is a lot of power in that um, in that particular measure. Obviously, it can be improved. Um, obviously, different ways of assessing the quantitative value can be done. But at least you have a direction for thinking, you know, how you can maybe in your work implement some of these ideas. I hope it was useful for you. I really enjoyed having this opportunity and I wish you all the best. Okay. I, uh, th that kind of uh, model for big areas, like it works for pluvial floods or it's uh, just suitable for riverine floods, like... Uh, Only the location, yeah. And in, in, in my opinion, you can use it f as we did, because that's a kind of uh, grid type of analysis. It covers, you know, various regions, and the calculation of the grid does not make the difference in the type of flood. It's the same way how the grids in uh, urban environments and in the rural environments, in the case of large watersheds, small watersheds are being treated. So the solution of the dynamic equations are, and, the, uh, in, and the routing equations uh, is, being, is being done uh, within the cell, uh, the cell or the spatial resolution unit. So I don't know did this answer your question, but I'm trying to say that each cell is treated in the same way, hydraulically. Yeah. Okay, no. Any other questions?
We can open the discussion because we have a little bit of time. Uh, if you want, we can talk about you know more questions. Don't, we don't have to relate only to you know what was covered in the in the presentation. If you have anything, um, anything related or anything that you guys think is important and it's missed, let me know. Professor, uh, Pedro has a question. Okay, so he's asking if in these places that you presented in Canada, they have some historical floods, or it's becoming more frequent now because of the changes in climate. Yeah, yeah, that's very that's very visible, very visible. I did show you this part of the eastern, you know, the kind of Montreal. This is the between the border between Ontario and uh, um, and. Uh, Quebec. Um, there is a river which is part of the border. It's Ottawa River. Ottawa is the, our capital city. It's basically on one side of the river, and there is a, in Quebec on other side of the river the same kind of city. Yeah? And that region was flooded last three years, three times in a row. Huge, huge kind of impact. But also you have to understand that many of these regions, especially urban regions, are subject to uh, um, quite a change of the natural conditions in the watershed. So we are facing the combined effect of the change of the land use and increase in the urbanization together with the change of the climate, uh, climate input. And it's not always easy to kind of separate, you know, to separate these two. Um, in this particular region, Ottawa, border between Ontario and Quebec, where we experienced in the last couple of years major flooding, uh, there is a hydropower use that's changing the basically regime of the water on the river. There are some storage facilities. Uh, and it's interesting when it's you know heavy rain and when you that storage may be beneficial for flood uh, control, uh, it's not available for flood control uh, because the main driving force is the power generation. So so there are some issues in the way how the watersheds are being regulated and used, um, and there is potentially conflict between the consumptive use like for power generation for water supply and you know flood control if you look at the storage if you look at the reservoirs these two are always in conflict you know for flooding you would like to have empty space in the reservoir for water supply you would like to have full reservoir and for hydropower and so on Professor, uh, Gabriela has another question for you. Uh, do you think population is aware about these changes in climate? If they are aware that they are, they can be threatened because of this, these changes? Um, I, or they yeah, are I am. I am. I am sure the population play, plays important role. Um, I don't think for Canada this is significant. I mean, Canada is a very large country, and I think the, this is why. Okay, so so the kind of climate change is being addressed in the international community in two different ways. One is you know the mitigation, and another one is adaptation. Mitigation is mainly mainly focusing on reduction of the emissions and the change of the concentration of the greenhouse gases. And in Canada, there is a huge effort in that direction. The, even the current elections, which are going to happen in four weeks, uh, one of the key issues is you know what are we going to do with the emissions? And change of the emissions is you know very very significant economic decision because it's going to affect the different industries, how they make the products, what do they, you know, what are the emissions, how much they should be paying for the emissions and so on. And another part is the adaptation to changing conditions. And so if you look at the whole country of Canada and 37 million people, our contributions are so minimal. If we, if we completely cut the emissions it's on, on a global scale, it's not going to be visible at all. <laughs> because it's such a small, you know, it's such a small uh, uh, country compared to China, India, United States, and so on. Uh, so, I, my, you know, my very high level of trust is that we cannot do much with the emissions. 
the more effort should be put in adaptation. And everything that we were talking about during this week is mostly focusing on adaptation, finding the way how to deal with this, you know, changing. Uh, look into the population in, in, in Canada is very specific because our population is not only controlled by the natural processes of birth and death, they are, we have a very active in-migration policy. The Canada needs people, and Canada is allowing the immigration of the people. The immigration numbers are controlled by the government in the sense of, you know, how many jobs are available, what kind of jobs are available, what is the distribution of the population in different age groups, so that do we have enough people in the age group that can support the economy and so on. So it's a it's a artificially controlled process of the population growth. It's not the same as in other places where you don't have that immigration playing the role. Uh, so, so the government can adjust the population, change in the population. But altogether, we are talking 37 million people like San Paolo, yeah. <laughs> Basically, you know, the whole country. So it's a very, it's a very different uh, scale. Um, um, the, the, I, I think it's important for you also, your country is larger and you can do something on the mitigation side and especially with Amazonia and, you know, the issues of the kind of clear cutting and, you know, having the Amazon as a very important source for accepting the CO2. Uh, uh, it, you know, it's, it's very different from, you know, what, uh, what we can do. Canada is also a pretty good uh, large source because we have a, that kind of boreal forest, you know, is a very large part of the territory. But it's not affected by the population. No one is cutting the boreal forest in order to, you know, proceed with agriculture where you have this type of intentions in Amazon. Um, but adaptation, I think, is what deserves our serious attention. And if you look at us as a kind of engineers, all our activities, I think, have to be have to be, you know, biased or affected by this thinking of how can we ensure that what we do today can function under the future changing conditions. How we can actually maybe make today's decision, you know. Uh, uh, produce the impacts in the future, better impacts in the future, uh, and that's that's I think uh, you know resilience. That's where systems approach. That's where you know various of technical tools can help us. You know maybe do that. I don't know. Did I answer your question? But but that's a you know that's a difference between kind of focusing on controlling the population and 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 the mitigation versus adapting to changing conditions. Tell me, did you like this week? <laughs> what did you like, what you didn't like? <laughs> don't, don't hesitate. I'm not going to mark anything. <laughs> You're not going to get a grade. I like to learn so that I can improve, you know. I'm telling that to my students that don't believe me. <laughs> Okay, so I see no <laughs> okay. I see no comments, yeah. <laughs> I asked them I, I asked them no 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 I asked them what did they like and what they didn't like during this week and they are rejecting to answer the question. <laughs> Professor <laughs> Yeah yeah Oh you have to come. I will say that we like very much and we are very impressed about the tools and about the number of people who did the tools. Uh, <laughs> that was very impressive. And I think well, it was great. Yeah. Um, I didn't dislike it okay. at all. But do you, do, do you see the value? Will you be able to use some of the ideas that we did? Oh, sorry. Will you be able to use some of the ideas that we covered during this week to affect maybe your research or some of the activities that you will have? Yeah? 
I think that was, uh, you, you see, you know, when you come from outside, you know, Mario maybe had a much better picture and understanding why he invited me to come. But for me, it was harder to kind of fully understand how useful will be what, you know, I am doing for you guys. And I'm very happy to find if you see some of the value in that. And, yeah. Okay. So Mario, we, 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 finished the, we finished the kind of uh, uh, discussion and the, Sorry. Uh, we finished the discussions and with, with all the presentations and uh, I, I kind of, I think, you know, the good cross-section was provided in a way how you can assess the change, the need, um, the little bit of value in the systems analysis and also the tools like, you know, resilience and others that I demonstrated uh, that can be uh, that can be used. So I, I am I am really hopeful that this will be of some value to okay. some of the students. And if there is a need and, you know, we discuss the possibility for the future collaboration, yes. uh, I'll be happy to kind of, you know, continue that, maybe even help with some of the theses, evaluation or something. Okay, yeah, that's, you, that's you, very important. Because you already mentioned that you okay. do that at this university with, international, uh, with in external examiners and things like that. Yes, uh, uh, so, sorry that I, I need to, to teach today in the morning and also to, to find out some historical golden documents we are going to present. But first point is, of course, uh, about the uh, material, the, the reference, all the uh, digitalized and also or printed, eh? all are uh, uh, in internet. So Professor Slobodan Simonovic kindly shared all uh, his knowledge and also the opportunities, the directions. I have only one uh, ask, uh, question. The possibility to introduce, if you have some knowledge that you can, or do you like to share with him or with the audience, it is possible because we create a repository and you can uh, find these lectures, also this material, this reference. But if you have some your, your own reference, your own, own literature, please share with us. Yeah. I'm I, would, I would suggest that I would, uh, I think that That's the first point. It will, idea. it will be good idea because many of you will be finishing and when you kind of finish the thesis, especially those of you who attended this advanced school and so on, kind of putting that also on the, on the, common, on the common website repository because then, you know, we can continue the dialogue along the same line. You are doing the research in one area, but there is opportunity to maybe use some of the knowledge that presented in the school for the future colleagues, younger you know people and yeah. when they come up with their I know that you know your case you're coming up with the proposals but it's good to see what has been done so that you don't repeat or you don't spend too much effort in 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 kind of you know uh, doing that but you kind of continue your research or the future generation continues the research based on the research that you guys already done to provide a little bit of continuity and use the school and this knowledge no, no, that's, uh, to, that's to kind of guide that. Okay, so uh, that is the, an invitation and we are going to be uh, officially in this direction. So for this module, Felipe will be the manager, the, our CEO uh, about that. So he's on responsible to, uh, uh, to follow and update the, the, the process. So I have a contribution. Uh, two years ago, are presenting a, 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 a conference, an invited conference, also a, a, a speech invited by Professor Slobodan and the organizing committee. And I'm going to introduce these uh, uh, slides into this repository. Uh, that is a way I say, okay, it's two, two years, uh, went out, went, went by, but we're still on tracking in, in, the, in this same direction. So, uh, so that's please share with us if you have some contributions. So this is one point. The second, that uh, also we discussed it in this week, the possibility of uh, PhD students uh, exchange. Eh? So we are opening the, the, the floor. Of course, we are uh, uh, seeing and discussing how can we promote with new visits in Canada or even in Brazil, 
uh, from the institute uh, also when pro where professor is, is working as uh, in the engineering uh, as a, a director of the engineering science board uh, uh, and also myself as the coordinator of the center of research and education on disasters in, in Aduspe. so we are trying to uh, go ahead in, in this direction of the two centers and institute to promote uh, these linkings uh, but in parallel we are very open to your uh, uh, um, uh, possibility to, to create the exchanging conditions. So we need the scholarships, of course. We need to submit the proposal to get the scholarships. And this is very important that you, you are the main actor. If you are not motivated to do that, we cannot do the step uh, 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 on and for what. So we need that you first being motivated to make this step on. Yeah? You say, I'd like to make an exchange with Western University, visiting Professor Simonovic and so on, spending one year, one and a half, two years, I don't know, but this is up to you. Uh, so we are very open, and please uh, report to me, or uh, is, I can share immediately to Professor Simonovic uh, who, are pe who are the people like uh, uh, wanted to do that. Also, even uh, through a postdoc uh, situation. Uh, uh, also, uh, we, so the third is that we are very, um, we're inviting that you can submit contributions to this next international conference of flood management in Iowa next year, August next year. <clears throat> and the deadline is, is, is in the next months. Uh, November. 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 So it's two, yeah. two, two months. Huh? And also, uh, you, you got the leaflets, uh, and there is an open invitation for you who are kind of working in any, anything related to systems for that special issue that, you know, I'm kind of editing, and feel free to kind of submit your uh, research that will be, you know, subject to the rules and regulations of the journal, but I am kind of playing a role in assembling the special issues. So the idea, and it's actually great to come from different regions, will be to see, you know, where the value and applications are already in place, how is the systems analysis helping or not helping, uh, even documenting documenting things that are, you know, did, didn't contribute significantly will be will be very very useful for that special issue, and uh, because the water is open um, uh, uh, open access journal, uh, you I would suggest when the special issue is prepared, use that as a resource. I think it will be a pretty good resource and be, it will be a pretty good opportunity because it's going to combine the experience from different places. I contacted everyone I know and I've been working in all my, all my life, you know, to actually consider consider submitting the contributions. So there's two invitations. There are two one, invitations. One yeah. from the conference, the deadline is in November, and for the, oh, the, 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 the special issue of Water Journal is That's in... March, March, March next, next year. year. So there is enough time. Enough time. So we have enough time to discuss with our supervisors, with our colleagues, uh, also, uh, and also with us. If you need some uh, uh, directions, please uh, uh, tell us about your your uh, suggestions. Please don't, don't be ashamed to ask us, eh? even in Portuguese, Spanish, or English, or Serbian. Eh? Yes, Serbian yes. yes. is accepted yes. also. Yes. Eh? Yes. Uh, well, um, uh, and also um, we have a long term vision that uh, maintain the distinguished uh, visiting professorship to Professor Slobodan Simonovic. Okay. I, I, I was uh, very clear to him about that. This year, the CAP is eh, uh, uh, granted his uh, uh, participation and also he partially contributed because we need an, uh, an, a contribution about the travel uh, uh, airfare uh, ticket also he contributed he paid also part of his uh, 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 stay here and thank you very much for staying with us that was very uh, nice from your part but we are starting a long-term partnership that means next year and the, 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 the year after this next year so we are trying to envision a long-term partnership. That means 
we need new grant research proposals to be submitted to uh, either to the Brazilian or even to the Canadian or together uh, cause. And that is also the way that the young scientists can contribute, not only uh, writing papers, but helping us, contributing with ideas, and also with some energy, that for us to be excited to submit new research grant, grant research proposal. So that is very important because if not, we have no scholarships, we have no grants to, to invite students or, or professors. So it's yeah. part of a cycle. Yeah. Uh, and as it's all important that your contribution to these different dimensions, like manuscripts to, to, to journals, contributions to, to conference, uh, be part of brainstorming new grant research proposals, and also be exposed to potential exchange, yeah, academic exchange missions or research missions. That is very important. That is the way uh, we can uh, grow in yeah, the partnership. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would like I would like you. Yesterday, some of you were asking me, you know, about the kind of future and so on. And and I'll give you in a very brief, uh, in a brave, very brief statement, what I think the future will be. Uh, the, the, there are huge issues where both countries, Brazil as well as Canada and many other countries around the world are going to uh, deal with the changing conditions. And I think one very significant direction is focus on the infrastructure, on the water-related infrastructure. You have issues in the water supply and sa safety or security of the water supply, but the infrastructure is going to, it's, so it's not only the quantity and the quality of the available water at the, available, uh, the particular location where you need the water, but it's also how is this going to be provided? What are you going to do with this infrastructure which is already old and needs, you know, and dying for the maintenance funding? And what are we going to do with the future infrastructure? So think about that. This is where I think our profession is going to make the major contribution in the future. And that's the way I think most of our work should be kind of channeled to kind of support finding the better solutions, finding more sustainable solutions, um, uh, really trying to increase the resilience of the people, individuals, resilience of the communities, and the resilience of the overall country. And that's, uh, uh, that, that's, I think, something that you guys as a young future professionals should kind of keep in mind, uh, that, 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 you know, that should be related to you kind of your work and your future contribution to the... Uh, we are not simply speaking to students. We are speaking to the future, perhaps, municipality secretaries are here, so perhaps state secretaries or even federal secretaries here, governors, deputies, uh, uh, majors, you are going to be part of this cycle. This is the normal cycle. So we are uh, just uh, uh, dreaming about that. So, and we need to start new pro uh, good projects. So uh, I think this, this, this kickoff, uh, it's a kind of kickoff yes. partnership, uh, and a starting, a starting partnership, and, but we need more energy to maintain this, this partnership at the medium and long term. Medium long term means minimum three to five years. So new research projects, submi submissions, new co-authored papers, manuscript is very important. Sometimes you have the idea, but you need some other co-author to help you to shape this idea into a uh, more attractive thing to the audience. Please, ask us. Not necessarily to be, become an, a co-author, but perhaps to give an, a tip, a recommendation to, to, to enhance your, your findings. That is, and if you like, eh, please invite us or invite professor. Even if you are in Australia and you can, uh, cannot attend because it's so far away, and please uh, uh, send your contribution with uh, other co-authored uh, co uh, 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 authors. Eh? So, Take, uh, t use and abuse of your research network in a good sense. And that's, that is very important. Uh, yes, okay? That's good. Well, um, you, you have some, from, from the academy, you have some uh, comments, no. remarks? Because we, you are, we are preparing a very, very short uh, 
memory about one special person that shaped our lives commonly to, to Professor Slobodan Simonovic and myself in the last decades, in plural. Okay? And also was a person, uh, of course, we have a lot of friends uh, in this situation. Some of them still are living, and some of them uh, have, have, have passed away. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the example uh, is still alive and, and very fresh. And also, I would like to, to mention André Chardon. Uh, André Chardon is a, a, a researcher also that uh, uh, worked with Professor Ruben Alaina Porto, and after that, uh, now Professor Slobodan Simonovic, and now he's working in Canada. So here we have our very, very simple uh, uh, memory, but very important for us, to uh, a, a high visionary man that was uh, Professor uh, Ruben Lalaina Porto. Ruben Alaina Porto, you know, was professor uh, of, the, of the University of Sao Paulo at the uh, Polytechnic School at the campus in, in the main city in Sao Paulo, and passed away in, in, in July. Eh? In, 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 this is in 1st uh, uh, July. Uh, at that moment, we, we have in the middle, in the field, all, mostly of people here, we, we have uh, been uh, uh, visiting field experiments. And Jubel Alaina Porto uh, was a, a visionary for us, and also uh, with his generosity, shared with us eh, and with a huge audience of younger, young scientists and, and meet and, and serious scientists, his thoughts and also several of his thoughts became real actions in terms of water systems analysis and water system uh, management and decision uh, uh, making uh, an optimization of this decision making for several parts of uh, Brazilian states. Not only in Sao Paulo, but also in Northeast Brazil, his contributions were very valuable. Right? So uh, this is a photo of Professor Ruben Alaina Porto. Uh, I thought it was one, if I, have a good memory in a, in a round table we have together in Sao Paulo, I think uh, four years ago. Um, also, we, we, we would like to have this memory and a very short words in, in his memory and also to his wife, Monica Porto, uh, who has also a very long-term friendship with us. So my words and memory and in memoriam to Professor Ruben Alaina Porto, uh, promoting this uh, generation, several generations of scientists, hydrologists, and also the stakeholders and decision makers in Brazil and overseas countries. Thank you, Ruben, for your inspiration. My words is, is, is to, to you. So I had a very close connection to Professor Ruben and uh, Monica over the years, my first contacts and uh, visits to Brazil were basically uh, organized and an invitation by Professor Porto. He was amazing, uh, amazing professional colleague, hydrologist, and also such a nice person. Um, I would like to share one small kind of memory. Uh, we were talking about their time, Monica and uh, Ruben spent time in Colorado. Uh, I think, State yeah, Colorado State University, they had a collaboration with the Colorado State University. And for them, as people, you know, from South America, it was very interesting to see the snow and, you know, uh, compare with activities in Brazil, you know, the, the activities that people enjoy in Fort Collins. Fort Collins in a high elevation, and during the winter, students, professors, and others are spending more time skiing than actually doing any work. And the person that uh, Monica and Ruben were communicating with, there. Uh, is a professor over there, but it's uh, also a professional skier. Very, very good. So he took them both skiing. And that was the first time in their lives that 
<laughs> they were first on the snow and then second on the skis on the snow and they were telling me they were telling me about their experience and you know how they were spending most of the times in the snow instead of on the snow and I still remember you know that uh, that time Ruben and Monica came I was organizing a workshop on the flood control and invited special groups of people from different parts of the world so they came to London when I moved to London and uh, uh, they shared the kind of experience, his experience in can in Brazil, in different parts of the Brazil, at least on that, and that was the kind of introduction of the Andre. And you know, you have seen how successful this collaboration uh, with Andre was. Ruben was also very instrumental in Sao Paulo of establishing the uh, kind of. Uh, center within the university that was doing work with the you know uh, companies like Sabespi and others, uh, and and I think that work uh, that work really generated some uh, pretty significant tools. Sabespi is right now using the tool which is fully simulating the water supply system for the uh, for the city of Sao Paulo. Uh, the system is kind of used in a in a, uh, a regular. Uh, uh, real time by observing the water flows uh, through the tunnels and pumping stations, uh, elevations in the reservoirs, and assessing, you know, how much water can be kind of extracted from each part of the system. So I think huge contribution and very large loss for our community as well as your country. Yes, thank you, Professor. And I would like to ask you for uh, a historic applause in memoriam of Professor Pumila Lama. Okay, um, we are very, uh, of course, our feelings are, are exposed. And now also the last point is about the history and the future. So uh, we, yesterday we have uh, some celebration after the lecture and discussing. I, I, we, I had uh, a very important discovery that is because after I returned from Germany one and a half decades ago, I put a lot of books in, 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 in my rooms, a lot of books, buildings of books, and sometimes say, okay, I have these books of this conference, of the first international conference on flood defense. You have the, no? Uh, okay, and here, uh, yes, uh, uh, and now kind of leading the community which is organizing these conferences, and the first conference was on the, on the uh, there is a website, ISDFM.world. The, all conferences are being stored, and for the first conference we were missing the data. Uh, we talked to the person from Germany who was a professor who initiated that, and yesterday I discovered in the discussion with Mario <laughs> that he has the proceedings from the first one. And I'm so happy. I'll take them to Canada. We'll scan them. Uh, <laughs> we, have, we have also the photo, and I have. I, 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 it was the pleasure to be part of the organizing committee of yeah. the first international <laughs> conference. I, I was here in the photo with her. Uh, we had, um, of course, was in 2000, in September 2000, this is uh, 19 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Uh, it was the first, and at that time, the, 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 the name was International Conference of Flood Defense. So you can see how this paradigm Changed, changed in the last two decades yeah. from uh, defending to management. Ah, and that is, uh, of course, we have new challenges, uh, more uh, uh, interdisciplinary ones eh, than perhaps the, the previous uh, uh, idea of more hard engineering with measures, uh, measurements and, and so on. And, and, and also I think the change was really done on purpose. We did it with the organization of the fourth meeting in, uh, in Canada because we realized that, you know, flooding is affecting so many countries. The frequency is increasing, the magnitude is increasing, and our ability to defend ourselves is, 
you, know, you cannot defend yourself. We have to accept the fact we need to live with floods. And now is defining the best way to kind of manage the risk and deal with that risk is probably the path to go. We will not eliminate the floods in the future. You have seen my main message about Canada in the last presentation. And that was the kind of evolution of the name uh, or the term uh, uh, or the name of the conference. So Felipe is preparing to, to show up if, if feasible to, to show you some photos. And of course, uh, several uh, colleagues is, are still working. Eh? Um, last time in, in, in July next, this year in Montreal, I met again uh, Soros, Professor Soros Sorosian from California uh, 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 University in Irvine. And also, uh, I, I told him, do you remember me? Yes, I remember you. We, we met each other 19, eight, eight, 15 years ago in Castle, huh? and so that is the memory is not is not lost. Huh? <laughs> that is, uh, is is very interesting. Uh, it, it, I would like also to invite you first to possibly uh, submit and attend the conference. And one of the one of the directions that the conference is taking is to be yeah. independent to be independent from the professional associations. We would like it to remain and be the platform for anyone who is doing work related to flooding so that you can meet you know, with your colleagues engineers, but also talk to economists, talk to lawyers, anyone who is doing kind of work. And uh, that format is going to be preserved. I'm working very hard. Uh, another objective is to engage as many as possible younger people, people like yourself, so that you see the you know, potential interest to continue supporting these meetings and conferences. And I am definitely looking for someone younger to replace me in the leadership of that, because my age is getting the, to the point that I think the conference may benefit from some fresh blood and younger people. <laughs> so that's uh, the, the part of the memory. Our pictures are there. Okay. I remember Maria Clara in 2014. We uh, uh, returned to, to Castle, but returning with eight students. And Maria Clara was there. And also, we take a picture in the same place, but with the new faces eh? and, and, and not so many hairs in, 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 the, in, in the heads. Uh, so, with the new, with the new uh, director also, that's uh, the old director, this is Tensman passed away, and we have the, the new professor, Professor Stefan Theobald, and especially we have an uh, MOU of exchanging students with Castle University and USP. Uh, I am the, the, the coordinator. So there are several pathway, pathways to, uh, to go ahead in, in, in this direction of in, uh, uh, um, um, uh, water infrastructure and resilience. Huh? So, okay. So you are trying to, to, to find out my, where, where, are, where am I? Huh? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, I think we are approaching to, to the end. Um, my final words are to, to summarize this, this lecture. Do you have more? being envisioned as a, as a source of information for you. There is, there is a section on the news uh, where on a kind of weekly basis the information is being shared. Uh, the contributions, if you would like to write small contributions, we are evaluating the contributions and providing them in the form of the commentaries, in the form of, you know, important issues that may need a resolution in the different places. So, so trying to use this as a platform for those who are kind of interested in flood risk management, but not only the conference, but during the period in between the conferences that we can maintain something. Uh, it, it, we have a now permanent secretariat supported by Chinese, and I'm so happy that they, do, they, they did provide that. They are providing money behind this. Uh, they have a staff. I am in a regular kind of uh, contact and control of that. 
but uh, uh, this, is, this is something that I would encourage you to kind of visit from time to time. It may be useful. We are putting some documents and information. I don't see the menus. Uh, menus are somewhere. Yeah, the yeah. menus is in the Yeah, area. yeah, you will, you will see. Yes. So there is information on the, about the ICFM logic. Uh, there is a list of all the conferences and the only information was this one. And uh, we are going to scan, and so, so for each conference, you have all the papers, all the presentations, everything kind of stored, uh, stored there, good repository of the yes. kind of the knowledge. And this is where I am saying, you know, you can provide a small kind of uh, written document, you can raise some questions or issues. We are very much open. Thank okay. you. Thank you, thank you, Slobodan, for this memory. Also, and the invitation is still open. So we are approaching to the end, and as I, just, I would like to say many, many thanks uh, for you to come in here to visit us. It's your first time in São Carlos city, a uh, college town, uh, a mid-side city, but with so many students. Uh, and also, this is the proof that we have several, we have uh, big motiva motivation to go beyond. Uh, for the next steps. Uh, we have several graduate programs here attending, uh, uh, and also coming from the other cities in, in this network of the uh, School of uh, Advanced Studies on Water and Society under change. So I would like to thank the CAPES, uh, the, uh, this is the coordination de aperfeiçoamento de pessoal do ensino superior. This is in a Brazilian research institutions also, mostly of you have scholarships from CAPES, maintaining their scholarships on CNPQ, on FAPESP, and of course, several other uh, institutions who uh, side by side are contributing to this moment. So, and especially to Slobodan, and mainly to also for Felipe, because without the academy energy, we are going to no point, no point. Eh? And thank you very much for your very uh, 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 shareful uh, approach to all the things, the tailored, uh, the integration, also the visionary aspect was very, very helpful. Thank you very much, Felipe. Uh, I would like to thank you to all the students uh, for this moment. And the next invitation, next week, we have another module with the, the Professor Raghavan Srinivasan from uh, Texas A&M University, also giving a course uh, from what is SWAT model, also with Brazilian uh, uh, Professor Lady, this is Daniele Bresciani, also an alumni from these institutions, uh, this is uh, this USP. Um, also, more modules are going be, to be announced in October and in December, probably. Well, Professor Shimin Kai of uh, University of Illinois, Professor Marcelo Garcia from, of uh, University of Illinois, and Professor uh, Patricia Gober of Arizona State University, and Professor Howard Witter, that is the, the uh, um, um, uh, professor, is retired, but. Uh, working in, in, in research uh, uh, related to water se security in Saskatchewan, also in Canada. Also. Well, thank you very much for all of you. Have a nice day. Have a nice weekend. Take care about the sun. OK, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I want to thank Felipe for taking care of me and being very, very seriously concerned. Can I find the hotel or find the university from the hotel? <laughs> and I would like to thank also our staff, uh, Junior and Marcelo. Hudson sometimes also uh, has worked. Thank you very much for your support. Muito obrigado, Junior and Marcelo.